صلوات السلام علیکم بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم لا حول ولا قوة الا بالله العلی العظیم الحمد لله رب العالمین و صلی الله علی سیدنا و نبینا و بالقاسم المصطفى محمد و علی آله الطیبین الطاهرین لا سیما بقیت الله فی الارضین اجل الله تعالی فرجه الشریف و جعلنا من اعوانه و انصاره Last night we talked about the concept of Akhiru Zaman, the end of the time, its meaning, its significance, and we said that there are two main uses for this combination of Akhiru Zaman. And we said one is a period of time which ends with end of life in this planet with resurrection but it starts around the time in which Islam started so the time of Jahiliya and then the time the Prophet وسلم, was sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to deliver his message to humanity. So this period of time is a common usage of Akhir zaman and we gave some examples from Hadith. The second is a period which is similar to this period in its end, but it starts later. So, and that is the period in which things will go to very, very uh, radical position and the world would be in need of a savior and then Imam Zaman Sharif would come till the resurrection. So this is similar to the previous usage in end but the beginning is different and as I said logically both are correct because whenever you have a line which starts for example, point A and end point, point B. So every part of this line which ends with point B and is after the second half can be considered as ending part of this. Okay? So it can be just, for example, one centimeter of the line or two centimeters. But what is important, it must end with the end of the line, with point B. Tonight I am going to refer quickly to the concept of Akhir zaman in other religions and inshallah I hope soon we can start our discussion about Akhir zaman from Islamic point of view and as I said we focus on the second usage and that is the time uh, before and after the advent of Imam Mahdi Ajalallah Ta'ala Faraj Hushari. Among the religions who have addressed the issue of Akhir zaman inshallah we will refer to Zoroastrianism and Hinduism and Judaism and Christianity. In Zoroastrianism they talk about three saviors. There are three saviors who have great mission to save humanity. And among them, the third is the most important one, the third. And that is what they call in the very old Persian language, which is used by the Zoroastrians, they call it Astawat Arata. And this is the greatest savior. Some of the things that I read from the text, to be accurate, and this is in Jamas Name. Jamas was a student, a disciple of 
زرتشت زرست and you may know that there is a discussion about Zoroastrians assalamu alaikum and according to some hadith that we have uh, we believe that this is a divine religion and many ulama many maraj they issue fatwa that they are considered as people of book as ahlul kitab in a particular hadith which is very famous imam says kana lahum nabiyun faqataluh wa kana lahum kitabun faahraqu they had a prophet but they killed that prophet some of them killed the prophet and they had a book from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they burnt the book but this shows that its origin is a divine origin Okay, in this book, Jamas Name, which belongs to Jamas, who was a disciple of Zorost, he talks about arrival of this savior. And he says that his arrival, this Astavat Arata or Soshians, is when the world is full of betrayal breaking promises, lies, and losing interest in religion. This is when they believe that the Savior would come. People go far from Allah, from God. Zulm, oppression would spread. Mischief and corruption would spread. And then the situation will be ready for the advent of this savior and they interestingly refer to some signs like you know we have Allah some signs they also have some signs and one of the things that they mention is that something would appear in a sky there would be a sign in a sky visible for people and also with instruction under a command from him, the savior, angels would come from east and west. The people who are doing mischief would deny him and tell that this man is a liar, the savior. But he would win them and defeat them. In another book, which is Kitab Zand, which is another source of the Zoroastrians, they refer to a battle between the army of Ahriman, which Ahriman in Zoroastrianism means evil, because they have Ahura and Ahriman. Ahura means God, Ahriman means evil. There would be a battle, and this battle would go on and on, and interestingly, they say, most of the time, this is before the Savior comes, most of the time, the people in the army of evil would win. They would be victorious. But they can never finally terminate and destroy the army of Ahura, the army of good. And then they say, that when it's very, very difficult, very, very tough situation, then God would send the Savior. And this battle of the Savior with the army of Ahriman would continue for 9,000 years. This is what the Zoroastrians believe. And then they will win the army of good and the army of God. They will win and destroy the army of evil. And then all humanity would be prosperous, would be happy, and live peacefully. This is a quick review of some sources of Zoroastrianism about what happens in Akhir zaman As you see, I said last night, something that you find very similar is that before the good end, there would be lots of problems and lots of mischief and corruptions and you know difficulties. 
you see that they have this. Of course, details are different. Mm, uh, some of the ideas may be different, but this is general. In Hinduism, among Hindus, again they have this idea of savior, and they talk about Akhiru Zaman, and they call it the age of Kali, the age of Kali, Akhiru Zaman. They talk about a savior who would come, and they say this would be after destruction of the world. This savior would come after destruction of the world, and he would have control of all the world, and everyone, whether a believer or unbeliever, would know him, and whatever he asks from God, he would be given. This is the idea of Hindus. Or in another book, they say, in the end, there would be a just king, Adel, a just king who would be the leader and ruler of human beings and angels as well. And he would have control over everything in land, in oceans, under mountains, everything would be under his control. And he would inform about what is happening in earth or in heavens. And no one greater than him will have ever been born. This is the idea of Hindus. Again, similar picture, tragic situation in the world, but finally ending with good and you know, peaceful situation. And a great man who is the greatest man would be there and would control everything. And his power would be not special. Uh, it would be not ordinary power. It would be special. In Judaism, if we refer to Old Testament, and I have brought with me the standard Persian Bible, which has Old Testament and New Testament, we will find many things which can be uh, sometimes interpreted in the way which is very similar to us, but it can be also interpreted in different ways. But the concept of Akhara Zaman is very clear. Whether they take it to mean or to refer to our idea of Imam Mahdi or not, that's a matter of interpretation. But the idea of Akhara Zaman is very clear. In Judaism, you find normally they talk about savior, and this savior, of course, a very obvious example is Jesus, Messiah. Messiah for them, which means the Savior, is the one that normally Jews believe he has not yet come because they don't accept Jesus. But they are looking for Messiah and they are waiting for Messiah, Savior to come. But according to some mm, texts that they have, we can understand that there are other people who come other than Jesus. And there is a beautiful conversation that the people, when the prophet Yahya, John the Baptist, the prophet Yahya, was asked by the people, are you Messiah or the prophet? He said, neither I am the Messiah nor the prophet. Because they were told that a prophet would come after Messiah. And they were wondering, Yahya is either Messiah or that prophet that they were waiting for. He said, no, I am none of them. I am neither Messiah nor the prophet. So some of the things that you can find, for example, I start with Psalms. And this is in uh, chapter 72. Uh, if you read this chapter, which is not very long, there are about 19 verses, you find they talk about establishment of justice by the son of the king. 
establishment of justice by the son of the king. And he would treat people, and men, especially this mention of the poor people, with fairness. And it's interesting that it said at that time, mountains, even mountains would bring peace to the world. It means that, you know, blessings would spread from everywhere. And he would defeat oppressors, the unjust people. And the unjust people would have fear. Then it refers to many, many things. And in the end, it refers to the fact that the name of God, the, the glorified name of God, would be filling all earth. This is a sign of victory of the army of God on the earth. This is in chapter 72. Also, in chapter 37 of Psalms, again, have, you, you have the same idea that this, and this is very interesting because, you know, the Quran says, لَقَدْ كَتَبْنَا فَالزَّكْرِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that we have written down in zikr, which means reminder, which refers to the Quran. Ba'da zabur, after Psalms, anna al ardayya rasuha ibadiya salihu, that my land, my earth, would be inherited by the righteous people. So the Quran mentions that this was written in Psalms, okay? That the earth would be inherited by the righteous people. Now, look at this. This is Psalms 37. Okay? Number 9. Verse number 9. The people who are waiting for God would be the people who inherit the, the earth. This is exactly the translation. Montazeran Khodavand Vares Zamin Khan. I fortunately I didn't have English Bible at home uh, so that I could read it. I mean, but I had this Persian standard. I purchased it in UK, you know, from the uh, international publishing house for the Bible. But I didn't have the English one. But you can go home and check, you know, if you have Bible or online. So it said the people who are waiting would be the people who would inherit the earth. And after a while, after a short time, there would be no wicked person. Again, the people who have patience would inherit the earth. And there are some other similar things. So it's very interesting because the Quran mentions that this has been written down in Zabur, that the earth would be inherited by the righteous people. This is chapter uh, Al-Anbiya, Surah Al-Anbiya, number 105. Also, in Bible, in the Old uh, Testament we discussed, now we come to the New Testament. You know, New Testament is a collection of four Gospels, and then many other books and letters. But the main part of New Testament is four Gospels. For example, in Gospel of Matthew, you find in chapter 24, there was a conversation between Jesus and his disciples. And Jesus was asked by his disciples about the end of the world. And Jesus talks about end of the world. If you read this description of Jesus about end of the world, you would find it's very similar to our understanding. But there is a problem here that many Christians, 
interpret it in a different way than us. They say the whole world would be destroyed and damaged and the establishment of kingdom of God would be after destruction of this world. But we believe and also we can understand it from the Bible that no, before the destruction of the world, before resurrection, there would be kingdom of God. Okay, so the kingdom of God would be established in this planet before the resurrection. And there seems to be a kind of confusion between resurrection and what happens before resurrection. But they have similar ideas in Matthew and also in Mark's, Angel of Mark's, Gospel of Mark's. So to save time, I don't think we need to refer to all of these things. But as you see, what is common is that every religion has to give answer to this human question. This is a human question. What would be my future? Not only as a person, as humanity. Everyone is thinking. And who, every prophet who comes, naturally people would ask him, what would be the end of this story? We see that there are problems between us and the people who don't believe, the people who fight against us, the people who do mischief. What is going to happen in the end? So every religion has to address this question. In addition to the need among human beings, this is very important for every religion to address this issue because this gives some direction to the believers. You know, if you know that there would be, in the end, establishment of justice, establishment of truth, all people would be obeying the religion of God, then your life would be changed. You would not easily give up. You would not easily be despaired and disappointed when you see problems. If you know that there is good end and you can contribute to that, so you would be much more motivated and determined to remain patient. So this is also very important and every religion is always trying to remind the people and followers that whatever happens to you, whatever calamities you go through, you must not lose your hope, you must not give up your hope. And of course, because we believe these religions have the same origin, there may be some differences, there are differences, but originally they come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, these divine religions I'm talking. So, the real and the essence must be the same, although there are changes and there are uh, variations. Okay. One of the things that is important and happens in the time of Imam Mahdi, Ajjalallah Ta'ala Farajahu Sharif, inshallah, we will talk about this more, but it's needed you know, to be mentioned now, is that Imam Mahdi السلام, would benefit from this common concept among people of different faith. So we should not think that everyone would be opposing Imam Mahdi unless he is, for example, a Shia. No, this is not true. There would be many, many people who would quickly welcome the call from Imam Mahdi السلام, for two reasons. One is that they are fed up, they are bored with what is happening in the world. According to some hadith, Imam Zaman comes when people have experienced and have tried any other way and then they are not satisfied. Then they look for something, you know, that can save them. So, many, many people 
who have tried other ways, other, you know, uh, schools of thought or, you know, other ways of behavior and conduct, would quickly answer to the call of Imam. The other thing is that Imam Ali Salam communicate to these people according to their own mentality. And this is very important. So the people who are, for example, Christians, they find Imam Mahdi alayhi salam talking to them in the way that it makes sense for them. We have a hadith, for example, that Imam Mahdi alayhi salam, this is in the book Al-Ghayba by Nu'mani, which is one of our early sources about Imam Zaman, that يَحْكُمُ بَيْنَ أَهْلِ التَّورَاتِ بِالتَّورَاتِ وَبَيْنَ أَهْلِ الْإِنْجِيلِ بِالْإِنْجِيلِ وَبَيْنَ أَهْلِ الزَّبُورِ بِالزَّبُورِ وَبَيْنَ أَهْلِ الْقُرْآنِ بِالْقُرْآنِ When Imam Mahdi comes, he would judge and he would rule in the way that the people who believe in Torah, the people who are Jews, they find that the judgment which is made by Imam is exactly in compliance with Torah. The people who are Christians, they find it it's in compliance with gospel. The people who believe in Psalms, the same. And the people who believe in Quran, the same. So this doesn't mean that Imam Zaman would act as a Jew or as a Christian or as a people who believe in Psalms because this is not possible to act in a way that everyone would accept and some of these actions are not correct. No. What is important is that Imam Zaman is able to show them that whatever I do is in compliance with what you believe. Okay? Maybe a new reading of what they have, a new interpretation of what they have. Anyway, it makes sense to them. And this is very important. So many of these people then would believe in Imam alayhi salam. And another thing which would help a lot is the advent of Imam Zaman with Jesus. When Jesus, when Isa ala nabina wa alayhi salam comes, then the people who believe in Jesus the people who are sincerely devoted to Jesus, then they would certainly believe in Imam Zaman because they see Jesus. Of course, not everyone. Because there would be then people who would say, no, this is not Jesus. This is not the Jesus that we were told of, told about. But the people who are sincerely looking for advent and arrival of Jesus, then they would quickly believe in Imam Zaman. And I think this is a very important plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this shows that Muslim-Christian relations must be very much improved. If we want to, you know, inshallah prepare for the advent of Imam Zaman, we must very much, I think, reckon on the close relation between Muslims and Christians. Because Christians are f forming and constituting about one-third of the population of the world. It's about one-third. And with Muslims, they would be more than half. And if these two are close to each other, then it would help a lot for the, inshallah, uh, preparation for the advent of Imam Sharif. And I think this is not an accident that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has raised Jesus and is sending him back with Imam Zaman. This is not an accident. Why not other prophets? Why he's not sending Musa? Why he's not sending Ibrahim? It shows that Jesus would have great number of followers up to the time of Imam Zaman. And his presence would be a support and would contribute to
to the mission of Imam Zaman. And inshallah, I am going to mention some of hadith about the Prophet Isa and his relation to Imam Zaman in the coming nights. Okay, I think I stop here and if there are questions. Yeah, yeah we'll have now question and answers. Uh, if we start with the sisters, please. I would be interested in knowing what would the status of Hazrat Isa be when he does appear, uh, given that uh, Prophet Muhammad, the, the prophethood, or Nabuat ended at that point, what will his status be when he does appear? Will he be a prophet? And then why is our prophet considered to be the last of the prophets? Uh, you know, we believe that Prophet Isa didn't die. Okay? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raised him. And as the Quran says, that, I take you and raise you, elevate you towards myself. So he is not dead. He is living, like Imam Zaman, who is living, like uh, the Prophet Khazr, who is living. But what is different in the case of Prophet Isa is that he is raised. What does it mean? It means that he is no longer on the earth. So he, is not, he has no mission at the moment on the earth. Okay? Unlike Imam Zaman. Imam Zaman is living, but he's living on the earth and among us. Jesus is living, but not on the earth, and not among us. He has no mission at the moment. When he comes back to the earth, then there is a hadith, inshallah, I'm going to mention this hadith, that Imam Zaman, alayhi salam, would offer Jesus to lead the prayer. And Jesus says, no, you must lead the prayer. Because at that time, Imam Zaman is in charge. And even, you know, we have a hadith from Imam Sadiq, uh, salam, in which he said, Lo adraktuhu la khadimtuhu ayyam hayati. If I were there in the time of Mahdi, I would have served him. I would have followed him. So in the time of Imam Mahdi, he is in charge. And whoever is there must support him and must follow him. So Jesus would not have a mission of preaching something different from what Imam Zaman is preaching. So, Any questions from the ladies? Salaam alaikum. Salaam alaikum. Thank you very much again for your lecture. Sheikh, every community who interprets events in, within their own context yeah. probably feels that they themselves are going, undergoing the worst type of torment and injustice. And of course, if we look, reflect back, and the event that we are here to commemorate perhaps is the greatest example of injustice that we could ever come up against. But has there been any analysis shown, especially as you reflected yesterday, that we are in the twilight of our time? to show that this time is particularly significant in being reflected at the, as the end of time. Yes. Uh, inshallah, what I'm going to do, I will mention to what we have in Hadith about Akhir zaman then you will judge. I don't need to judge. You will judge, are we possibly near or not? But what is important is, according to Islamic point of view, the time of Akhir Zaman, the time of advent of Imam Zaman, is not fixed. 
So there is no point of giving any figure, say any year, because sometimes you know people talk in other religions about a time, exact time, and sometimes you know you know that even you know before this new millennium, there were some people who said Jesus would come, you know, uh, in this mil uh, you know night of millennium whatsoever. According to us, not only we don't know, it's not even fixed. It very much depends on the way that human beings behave. For sure this is going to happen. But when, it depends on what we do. We can make it earlier, we can make it later. So, if we work hard and if we prepare for that, it can become sooner. But inshallah, when we read uh, those hadiths, inshallah, then you can judge, you know, what is the situation. Any questions from the sisters again? Assalamu alaikum. That uh, when the 12th Imam comes, he will talk to the people of Sabur and in, in jail and uh, um, uh, Tawrat, you say, according to their books. Now, I heard ulama saying that after the advent of 12th Imam, there will be um, only one religion. Does it mean to say that people who are following their books will be allowed to practice according to their books or they will convert to Islam? Yeah, but I didn't uh, touch this issue. What I said is that in the beginning, when Imam Zaman talks to them, okay, talks to them in the way that it makes sense to them, then they become, you know, motivated to accept Imam Zaman. So this is compatible with the fact that they may convert to Islam, okay? But inshallah, later we will talk about this issue. And this is uh, something that we can understand according to some hadith that the people would embrace Islam but there are some also indications that not maybe all people become Muslims okay so inshallah when I talk about the moral religious situation after Imam Zaman, inshallah I will talk about this and also we should talk about this ayah of the Qur'an, لِيُزْهَرَهُ عَلَى الدِّينَ كُلِّهِ What does it mean, لِيُزْهَرَهُ عَلَى الدِّينَ كُلِّهِ What does it mean that there will be no other religion, or there, this means Islam would be superior? So, inshallah, we'll talk about it. Any questions from the sisters? Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Um, I was wondering how important it is to have preconceived ideas of uh, Imam Zaman compared to actually making yourself ready in terms of character and wouldn't that be a way of actually being <coughs> able to recognize um, such character? Uh, what do you mean by preconceived ideas? Um, like knowing what signs exactly mm. would mean and what character and what thing. You know, uh, we need to do, do both of them. We need to know Imam Zaman alayhi salam and to strengthen our relation with Imam Zaman. This is very important. And at the same time, we need to know what is happening before Imam comes and what can we do to contribute to this. If we just, you know, have a, per, uh, a person who's a great, you know, lover of Imam Zaman, but he is not wise enough about what is happening or going to happen in the world and doesn't know how to uh, contribute to this and how to serve this, then uh, we may even you know, make mistakes and sometimes even if Imam Zaman comes, maybe then we would say, no, this is not Imam Zaman and the Imam Zaman that I was you know, loving is different. So uh, I think we need to do both. We should not just be busy with reading this hadith and talking about Akhir Zaman. Of course, we need to... Uh, pray for Imam Zaman, we need to strengthen our relation with Imam Zaman, we need to uh, do something good on behalf of Imam Zaman, like paying sadaqah or whatever. But at the same time, we need to know these things 
because this is a reality and this is not avoidable. And every mu'min must always be able to uh, identify the position and the stance that he's going to make. This is very important. I always say that a mu'min is like campus, like a, you know, qabla nama, campus. Qabla nama is only working, is only useful if it can always show. If it was working up to one week ago, then it, now it doesn't know what to show. Then it's useless. You don't say, okay, up to last week it was okay, so we keep it. No, it's useless. We throw it away. A mu'min who knows what was proper position in previous ages, in the time of the Prophet, in the time of Imam Ali, in the time of Imam Hassan, Imam Hussein, it's okay. But if he doesn't know what to do now, so this moment is not a proper moment. A moment is the one that who knows in every circumstances what direction he must have. So we need to know also these things, inshallah, to have proper direction. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Um, in the beginning of your talk, you mentioned various uh, sayings and proverbs from other major monotheistic religions and also Zoroastrianism and Hinduism yeah. and you said various alims have stated that Zoroastrianism is a divine religion however Hinduism to my understanding is a polytheistic and not divine religion so how is it possible that they have mention of Akhir Zaman or is it that it was initially a divine religion and has become polluted yeah In the case of Hinduism, normally we don't have fatwa, as so far as I know, that it is one of the you know, divine religions or Ahlul Kitab. But in academic discussions among our ulama, there is such a possibility. And especially when you go back to the, some of original texts of Hinduism, like for example, you know, Upanishads, Allama Taba Taba'i said this clearly, and Shahid Mutahari also mentioned this, that there are ideas in this you know, collection of books that cannot be by ordinary people. Such a profound idea about God that only can be taken and received from prophets. So it's not uh, you know, surprising if Further research may show in future that originally either it started with some prophets or they received something from some prophets, then they added something to this or whatsoever. But there are many profound ideas, despite the polytheistic aspect that now we see, which is obvious. But there are also monotheistic uh, elements in Hinduism. And so it's good that you mentioned, uh, because I didn't want to say that Hinduism today is, uh, you know, one of the people, you know, of book are Hindus. I didn't want to say that. So just what I wanted to say that these are the people who have uh, some ideas about the savior and they have also some uh, monotheistic origins. Because my friend, who uh, I have a friend who is a Hindu, and he says they believe in one God, but these gods that they have as representations are yeah. means to that God. Yeah. This is the way that even uh, pagans in the time of the Prophet were saying. You know, they, they were worshipping idols, but the Quran says that they were saying, وَمَا نَعْبُدُهُمْ إِلَّا لَيُقَرَّبُونَ إِلَى اللَّهِ زُلْفَةً they said, we don't worship these idols for themselves. We worship them so that they make us closer to Allah. So even those pagans, they knew that these statues are not God. But they thought that somehow these have some representational you know, power to represent God the One. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, no. Salawat. Allah. You may have heard this story that is mentioned in 
some of the books like Darus Salam by Araqi. There was a man, an honorable man, person from India who had gone to Karbala. He was a Shia and he went to Karbala and resided and you know, wanted to be resident in Karbala. And he was there for six months. But he never went to shrine of Imam Hussein. What he was doing was just doing ziyara of Imam Hussein from his house. So uh, he was going to the roof of the house and just doing ziyara there. The person who was at that time very much you know, respected and very much in charge was uh, also given the title of Naqib, which means master or in charge. He went to them, he went to him and said, I have heard that you have been in Karbala for six months and you have not gone to Haram, the shrine. And you just go to the roof and you do ziyara. This is not the way that you are supposed to do. This is for the people who are far away. People who are in other cities, in other towns. This is not something that we have in uh, Sunnah. And if you do this, I am afraid that late, sooner or later this may become a bed'ah. That people come here and they don't go to Haram, they just go to the roof and they do ziyara. This man said, you know, please exempt me from going to Haram. And I give you whatever money you want, you know, to spend on, you know, good causes. And he said, I am not after money. What is important for me is to protect the proper way of ziyara. So he finally had to accept to go to Haram for ziyara. So it's mentioned that he made ghusl for ziyara and put on his best dress and without any shoes, with bare foot, you know, he walked towards Haram. And when he reached the gate of Haram, so he kissed the gate and did sajda of shukr for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that has been given this tawfiq. And it said that he went inside haram while he was shaking. And, you know, he was not in a normal, you know, situation. And his color became pale. He became yellow. And with difficulty he reached the chamber and you know where is the actual zari and then he said is this the place that sayyid al-shuhada was killed is this the place sayyid al-shuhada was martyred and then he fell down and passed away and this was the reason that he couldn't go for ziyara. For six months he was in Karbala and he couldn't go for ziyara, but he couldn't explain that this is the reason. I cannot tolerate to go to the place in which Imam Hussein alayhi salam was killed. May inshallah we have also such a love inshallah and devotion to Imam. السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بفنائك عليك مني سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار 
ولا جعله الله آخر العهد مني لزيارتكم السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين سلام من بمحرم محرم گل زهرا My salutations to محرم to the محرم of flower of زهرا به لطمه های ملائک به ماتم گل زهرا My salutations to the angels who are mourning for the son of زهرا سلام من به محرم به تشنگی عجیبش My salutations to Muharram and a strange thirst in Muharram. Bebu yasi be zamin qam wa Hussein gharibash. My salam to the land of Karbala and Hussein who was alone in this land. Salam man be Muharram o Gusse o Gham Mahdi. به چشم کاسه خون و به شال ماتم مهدی My salam to Muharram and to the pain and grief of Mahdi for Hussein and to the dress of Azad that Mahdi is wearing in Muharram سلام من به محرم به کربلا و جلالش به لحظه های پر از حزن قرغ درد و ملالش My salams to Muharram and to Karbala and its glory To all the moments of sadness and full of pain in Karbala سلام من به محرم به حال خسده زینب به بینهایت داغ دل شکسته زینب My salams to Muharram My salams to the heart of Zainab Which was broken Which was full of sorrow Salam man be Muharram Be daz do majge abul fazl به ناامیدی سقا به سوز عشق ابوالفز بای سلام دو محرم انتو ابوالفز لباس انتو ایز هنز انتو دی کانتینر آف ووتر دات ای واز کرینگ My salams to the tears of Abbas when he couldn't carry water to the tents of Hussein. Salam man be Muharram be qad o qamat akbar be kam khushg azan goy zir neiz o khanjar. My salam to Muharram and beautiful Ali Akbar and to the dry throat under sores which was reciting azan. سلام من به محرم به گاواره ازغر
به عشق خجلت شام و گلوی پاره از غر مای سلام تو محرم ان تو دکری دلا و از غر مای سلام تو دفروت و از غر مای سلام تو تیرز آف امام حسین و نی دیدن نو هاو تو تگ از غر بگ دو از مادر سلام من به محرم به آشقی زهیرش به بازگشتن هور و عروج ختم به خیرش مای سلام تو محرم and to love of Zuhair when he decided to join Imam and remain loyal to Imam my salams to Hor and his sincere repentance salam man be muharram be muslim be habibash be rus pidi john va be buy atr ajibash my salams to muharram Muharram and to Muslim, the son of Aqil and Habib, the son of Muzayr. My salam to John, the black servant who was martyred and the fragrance spread from his body everywhere. Salam man, be Muharram, be Zang Mahmil Zainab. به پار پار تن بی سر مقابل زینب مای سلام تو محرم and to the caravan of زینب and all the cape thieves and rings of the birds who were carrying them and to the head of Imam Hussein which was being carried in front of زینب الا لعنت الله على القوم الظالمين يا حسين يا حسين يا حسين